This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to the show. As always, I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. You may know me from this podcast or maybe the website I created in 2015 called TudorsDynasty.com. Or maybe it was my COVID creation called HistoryLayer.com. Now, History Layer is a culmination of some of my favorite people, your favorite historians and authors, who share their wisdom with us through articles and videos. So if you haven't checked out HistoryLayer.com, do so today. This is episode 103, and I'm not being biased when I say it. This is one of the best episodes. (laughs) We get to talk about women in history. My guest is historian and author Elizabeth Norton. Elizabeth and I discuss queen consorts from Empress Matilda to Eleanor of Aquitaine to Elizabeth of York, the six wives of Henry VIII. We cover a lot of territory in a short amount of time. Most importantly, she convinced me on why people adore Eleanor of Aquitaine so much. On Ask the Expert, Stephanie welcomes back historian and author Leanda Delisle to answer your questions on the Gray Sisters, Jane, Catherine, and Mary. Lastly, I'm back for a brief history to tell you all about Elizabeth Seymour, the younger sister of Queen Jane Seymour, married three times, widowed twice, and saw the death of three of her siblings. A special shout out to all of my Patreon patrons. Your overwhelming support truly has me speechless. Especially this year, 2020 hasn't been easy for anyone, but please know how much I appreciate your support. Now I want to give a warm welcome and thank you to my newest patrons, Don L, Marie S, Crystal S, and Elise C. Welcome back. If you'd like to show your support, go to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash Tudor's Dynasty and click become a patron. If you would prefer instead to show some support by checking out my new merch shop, I'd encourage you to do so. I've been pleasantly surprised by how fast some of the stock has moved since I began sharing it with you. There's some really fun t-shirts and sweatshirts. Um, There's some socks on there coffee mugs, all different kinds of things. So if you want to check that out, go to the show notes. There'll be a link. All right, let's get on with the good stuff. Elizabeth, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Something people may not know about you and that I just recently discovered is that you're an archaeologist. Yeah, I mean, I used to be. I don't really do very much anymore. But yeah, no, I have a degree. Um, When I went to Cambridge, I did my degree in archaeology and anthropology. And then I did a master's degree at Oxford. It was always historical archaeology. So it was, you know, way past the Stone Age. And we're talking about sort of medieval and early modern. But yeah, no, I, I used to go digging a lot. That is so cool. It was honestly, it was my childhood dream to become one. So it, when I saw that you um, became one, I thought, oh my gosh, this is so cool because now I need to know what is the most memorable thing that you've discovered? So I discovered a cave in Algeria. So I have a cave named after me, which is pretty exciting. Um, so I, I went to do a survey of rock art in the Algerian Sahara back when I was a student and we were basically the person we were with had done a survey back in the 60s and then he wanted to go back and see what was still there because a lot was being removed and you know damaged and so we were surveying and I, I discovered a cave so I have a cave named after me which is pretty exciting. I'd say not many people can say that. No no it, it's, a, it's a bit of a claim to fame actually yes. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, I want you to know that one of the things that I most appreciate about you is that you have written about women from history and you've been educating us on this subject for about a decade right now on the faceting lives of these sometimes overlooked women. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I mean, I love writing about women. Obviously, I am a woman and I think that helps. But no, um. I think women are often very overlooked in history, not so much now, um, which is great. And there are loads of really good female historians sort of coming through and writing. And that's really great. But you still see views. You'll still see people saying, you know, actually, 
women's history it's a bit niche or actually it's men's history that's important and that all the important people in the past pretty much were male and actually I mean I think that's very much the result of the way people are looking at history because yes more men than women very many more men and women were the big public figures throughout history I mean of course you know, it's a patriarchal society in Europe at least um, but Actually, that doesn't mean that women aren't there or that they're invisible. It just means that you have to look in a different way. So, you know, I sort of by prioritizing women, I hope that I get people thinking about women's history, but also thinking it's not niche. You know, women are 50 percent of the population. So actually to study history, you have to look at the women because otherwise you're actually you've got a very skewed view of the past. And I felt like at the time you were one of the first to really start pushing out material on women. And it was, it was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was almost, it was a relief to finally see these stories coming to a head because it really has been all about the men for so long that it's great to hear the stories of these women because we are hearing parts of history that maybe we hadn't heard before. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really lovely to hear you say that about my work. And I'm I'm glad that you enjoy it. Um, Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of women who are sort of surprisingly understudied. So, you know, for example, I did a book on England's queens, which was just kind of little biographies of all the queens of England, right back from the Anglo-Saxon period all the way to the current queen. And actually, there were so many of the women there who didn't have a biography um, had barely been studied at all. And it was a lot of kind of myth about some of them, particularly the earlier queens. So it was, I mean, it was really fun to research their stories and to write about them, but also I think just to get their stories out there. And again, particularly the earlier queens. I mean, it was still really common with Anglo-Saxon queens, I mean, at least a decade ago for books on queenship to start. Of course, the Anglo-Saxons didn't have queens, but of, I mean, of course they did. Um they really, really did. And I always try and get that across, particularly when I'm talking about queenship in that, you know, um, Emma of Normandy, for example, the wife of Ethelred the Unready and then the wife of Canute. Um, she's called Emma Regina, you know, Queen Emma in all the sources. And most of the queens are in the pre pre 1066 context. Um, some of them are crowned. Interesting. Well, I was looking at your list of books and I noticed, I think it was the first one that you did was the She-Wolves one. What inspired you to make that your first book? So that's a very early book. So I wrote that a long time ago. And I mean, it was it was a really fun book to write. And it's called She-Wolves. Um, it was about sort of the notorious queens of England, so um, sort of medieval and early modern period. And it was really, it was to look at the reputations of women because so often women, powerful women particularly, have quite negative reputations. So, you know, you've got Isabella of France, who's the Queen of Edward II. Um, she's known as the She-Wolf of France and has a very negative reputation. And I mean, some of it probably is deserved, but equally, women are subject to st sort of stronger censure of their behavior and you know they're held up to higher standards for example empress matilda um who's a 12th century queen of england um she gets accused of being arrogant and unwomanly but actually what she's doing is what would be praised in a king you know she's she's insisting that subordinates come to her on their knees and you know she's insisting on her superiority and that's something that a male king, that's perfectly acceptable. Nobody would criticize a king for that. But for a queen, it's a very different story. So when I was initially writing the book, I wanted to look at these women who have negative reputations for whatever reasons. And it was quite a diverse group of women. And to try and pick out why they have these negative reputations and, you know, both contemporary views and also more modern views what historians are saying and it's a very old book and I'm not sure I agree with everything that I said in it but it was a really fun book to write <laughs> well I 
brought it up because I really want to talk briefly here about Eleanor of Aquitaine, and I want you to help me understand why so many people adore her so much. I mean, Eleanor, Eleanor's fantastic. I mean, I, I think I share the adoration. Um, she's just brilliant. Um, I think what's so interesting and important about Eleanor is just how vivid her life was and just and everything that she did. And in many respects, she was lucky because she had the opportunities that most medieval women could never have dreamed about. So Eleanor became Duchess of Aquitaine in her own right as a teenager and was married off to the King of France, Louis the Seventh. Um, it was a notably miss they they were completely mismatched um eleanor complained that she'd married a monk rather than a king um they very much struggled to have children and that that seems to have been louis's issue um they eventually had a daughter they then went off on crusade um eleanor was trying to annul her marriage to louis throughout the crusade and sort of came back a bit in disgrace they finally had a second daughter and after that louis agreed that they could go their separate ways that he'd annul the marriage. Eleanor then almost immediately married the future Henry II of England, um, had a big family of sons and daughters with him, and was very powerful, very influential. Um, the couple eventually separated, and Eleanor rebelled against Henry and um, was imprisoned for a really long time, several years. After Henry's death, her son Richard became king and she basically rules as regent and she's really really important to Richard's rule both in England and on the continent she was instrumental in winning the throne for her son John um, because there was another contender her grandson Arthur but she went with John um, and I mean even into her 80s she's crisscrossing Europe she's very political very mobile just absolutely fascinating she dies at the age of 82 which is I mean, that's a good age now, but for the 12th century, early 13th century, that was really, really old. She must have seemed like an absolute relic of her generation. And so I think you can't help but be fascinated by Eleanor's story because it's so rare for a medieval woman to have those opportunities and for the sources to survive to tell us about her life. She is a match or better than you know the king she encounters she's certainly more than a match for louis um she's so political and so interesting and i think you know it we have to put her in context and you know recognize that she's quite exceptional for the period it's not that other women couldn't have done what she did but she had the opportunities that they wouldn't necessarily have had okay you may have convinced me <laughs> that's good that's good yeah no do ellen is great <laughs> I, I see people talking about her all of the time and, and I often find myself going, I don't I don't understand. But it seemed like she caused so much upheaval and conflict. And um, but the way you put it, it makes her sound like an amazingly strong woman who kind of took control of things. She did. And I mean, I think a lot of the upheaval and the conflicts that we can see her causing and, you know, she you know, she was quite politically turbulent, actually. Again, a lot of it is to do with her asserting herself as a woman in a way that women weren't normally supposed to assert themselves. So, I, you know, I think it's a plus in many respects. You know, she was locked in an unsatisfactory marriage to Louis and she managed to end that and come away with her inheritance because most kings, if they were married to an heiress and the marriage was annulled, they would find some way of keeping hold of their wife's inheritance. But Eleanor managed to come out of that marriage with Aquitaine and she stood out against Henry. She rebelled against Henry, but she was also ruling Aquitaine independently for some time before her rebellion. So again, you know, yes, the rebellion is turbulent, but we can sort of see it more in the context that she's trying to assert herself. She's trying to assert her son's position against Henry. And again, I think it's quite a positive. Um, the problems over the succession when Richard died unexpectedly. So there was, it was basically, it was contested between Arthur of Brittany, who was the son of Geoffrey, Eleanor's um, sort of, well, the, the next son after Richard to survive to adulthood. Um, he'd obviously died. So Arthur was his heir. And then it was Eleanor's youngest son, John. And Eleanor really sided with John. I mean, it, in strict hereditary, of course, Arthur was the heir. So, I mean, that's, Turbulent. But again, you can see, you know, a strong woman 
fighting for the rights of her son. Um, so, yes, she is politically turbulent. Um, there's warfare, there's conflict. But again, I think in many ways she gets treated more harshly because she's a woman in that, you know, there was a lot of conflict surrounding Henry II, but actually he's less remembered for, you know, conflict and war and political turmoil than Eleanor is perhaps. Interesting. So now I, I, I'm curious and I'd have to ask, who would you say was the most controversial consort of a king of England? Most controversial. That's a tricky one. I mean, it's it's so difficult because you kind of have to look at their reputation at the time, so their contemporary reputation, and then also how their reputation has developed. You know, for example, Eleanor of Castile, who was the first wife of Edward I, she had an appalling contemporary reputation. She was um, considered very acquisitive, um, responsible for many of the king's unpopular policies according to sort of popular belief. Very, very unpopular in contemporary, but she was very, very unpopular to her contemporaries. And yet when she died, Edward erected a series of memorial crosses for her, the Eleanor crosses. And that really started a myth about Eleanor. And, you know, by the Victorian period and into the 20th century, she's seen as this perfect model of queenship. You know, her, she's the wife who inspires such queenly devotion. And it's really interesting because she's gone from being a really unpopular queen to actually one that's seen as a real ideal queen. So you do get that change in reputation. And we can see it in quite a lot of queens. There are some queens who have sort of maintained unpopular reputations. And, I mean, you know, I could throw out Isabella of France again, who was responsible for, um, she came over with an army to depose her husband, Edward II, and place her son on the throne. She had a lover. She probably murdered her husband. Um, but, you know, again, you can sort of see the reasons how she came to take those actions. I would say probably the queen with the worst reputation would be Isabella of Angoulême, who is the second wife of King John. And obviously King John has a very negative reputation and that sort of carries through into his wife. And I mean, Isabella of Angoulême, you get very few people sort of trying to rehabilitate her, to be honest. Um, she married John when she was very young, but the couple seem to have had a very turbulent relationship. Um, he suspected her of having lovers. She, um, he certainly had lovers. Um, after his death, she returned home to Angoulême, where she uh, married her daughter's fiancé and then used her daughter as sort of a bargaining chip to get the English council to consent to the marriage that she'd made um, before sending her home. She was um, eventually um, basically sort of double-crossed her son on a few occasions and was um, eventually found trying to poison the king of France. In the next reign, so in the reign of her son, her younger children by her second husband then all turned up in England and caused lots of trouble. So in general, I think she is probably the least popular medieval queen, both in contemporary views and in current views. And I mean, it continued into the next generation with her unpopular younger children. The drama of the Plantagenets kept us busy for over 300 years. But then the Tudors arrived on the scene and the first crowned queen's consort of England was executed. How do you think that that may have shifted the course of history? I mean, the execution of Anne Boleyn, it shocks us today. And it was profoundly shocking at the time because, you know, there had been there'd been the odd annulment by kings, not that many. King John's first marriage was annulled, um, obviously Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon. But annulments, people kind of understood them. They, you know, they occasionally happen. But to actually behead your wife, that was very, very shocking, profoundly shocking. And not something that Anne Boleyn would have seen coming. I mean, we know from what she said in the Tower that she was expecting to be divorced and sent to a nunnery because that's what you did with ex-wives if you were a king. Um, so the fact that Henry actually went so far as to behead her was really, really shocking. And it did send shockwaves. I mean, certainly Jane Seymour, Anne Boleyn's successor, spent most of her queenship absolutely terrified. I mean, we can see this in the sources. Um, at one stage when she displeased Henry, he reminded her very pointedly of what had happened to Anne Boleyn. Um, 
Henry struggled to find a fourth wife. Um, Christina of Denmark, whom he wanted to marry, reportedly said that if she had two heads, one would be at the King of England's service. Um, Anne of Cleves, was, his fourth wife, was, was certainly very worried about what would happen to her when commissioners came to her in the middle of the night, woke her up and said that the king was having doubts about her marriage. She was hysterical. According to reports of the ambassador from Cleves who was with her, she was crying and she was saying she was worried that she would go the same way as Anne Boleyn effectively, which you could see why she would. Um, then, of course, the fifth wife, Catherine Howard, did get beheaded. So, again, you know, you've got this It very much makes the position of Queen Consort quite insecure, the way Henry VIII got through wives. And it always opens up the possibility that actually they might be beheaded. And it's, you know, just absolutely shocking. Do you think when James I came to the throne in England um, that Anne of Denmark at that point felt pretty secure in in her role? I think Anne of Denmark did. Um, She and James... I mean, it's not a great love match. I mean, I think we all know about the rumours about James's sexuality. Um, obviously, you can't prove anything, but certainly, you know, he seems to have been interested in male favourites. Um, he and Anne led quite separate lives. They'd obviously clashed in Scotland over the upbringing of their eldest son. Um, Anne wanted to raise him herself, and James insisted that he be sent away and, and raised with um, a noble family instead. So that caused clashes. When James went south to England, Anne actually seized her moment and she went to Stirling Castle where her son was being raised and insisted that he be given to her. And actually she caused such a scene and got herself so upset that apparently she had a miscarriage. Um, James was embarrassed that his queen was not coming to England and eventually relented and allowed Anne to come south with her son. So it was a victory for her. But I think actually what that incident shows is she certainly seized the opportunity of James's absence to do something that he didn't like, that he didn't want. But it also shows that she was fairly secure in her position. You know, she she wasn't worried she was going to be beheaded or divorced. She's the mother of the king's heir. She's the mother of the second son. She's also the mother of his daughter. Um, she knows, you know, that actually she'll be fine. James might be angry. He might be embarrassed. But actually, she's still going to come south as Queen of England. I do want to ask you about Elizabeth of York as well, since um, she was the wife of Henry VII, the first Tudor queen consort. But I have to ask you the question that everybody, especially on social media, throws out there all the time. And I'd love just to hear what you have to say. If Elizabeth of York realized that Perkin Warbeck was her brother, is there anything that she could have done about it? So... I mean, personally, I wouldn't say that Perkin Warbeck was her brother, but if he was, assuming that he was and she thought that he was, um, no, there's not a lot she could have done about it. To be honest. I mean, there's not a lot she would have wanted to do about it, I would think, because actually she's the mother of Prince Arthur by that right. stage. You know, she's he's heir to the throne. And obviously, if her brother's still alive, then Arthur is no longer heir to the throne. And actually, at best, she's the wife of an exile if Henry VII had to flee the country if her brother takes over. So, I mean, I think the birth of Prince Arthur very firmly allied Elizabeth of York to the Tudor cause, because how could it not? I mean, you know, obviously she's still close to her sister, she's still, to her sister, she's still close to her mother. But by having Tudor children, their future relies on Henry VII being king, regardless of what Elizabeth of York may think about Henry Tudor, may think about his claim to the throne. Um, because actually she was hugely important to the Tudor dynasty, um, of course. But, you know, when you get sort of pageants celebrating Henry VIII's ancestry and the ancestry of his children, Elizabeth of York is always right up there because she was such an important ancestress. Henry VIII particularly was very interested in his grandfather, Edward IV. And, you know, although, of course, Henry VII doesn't claim the throne through Elizabeth of York, certainly the Tudors, she is their important ancestress. And then we move into Henry VIII and his wives, and you've written biographies for Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, and Catherine Parr. Yep. Of those four, who did you think, or who do you currently think is the most interesting of them? 
See, that's a really tricky question because they all are. Um, I mean, completely um, sort of putting aside any personal feelings, I think clearly Anne Boleyn is the most interesting. I mean, she how could she not? Um, she's very, very clever, very interesting, very ambitious and very, very driven. She came from very little to start to bring about the break with Rome. Um, she becomes Queen of England and very few English women were Queen of England. In fact, only I mean, Elizabeth of York, I suppose, was an English woman, but she's a princess. But Elizabeth Woodville is the only post-conquest precedent for an English queen at the time that Anne Boleyn is alive. So, you know, she really drove herself to the throne and it's so interesting. Um, and her queenship is really interesting because, she, you know, she's driven by ambition, but she's also driven by religious zeal. She and her brother are very, very interested in religious reform. And it's too early to call them Protestants. They're much more in the sort of Christian humanist tradition of Erasmus, of change from within the church. But certainly they are trying to reform the church. And that's really interesting. And then we've got, you know, Anne's relationships. We've got her relationships with her family. We've got her relationship with Henry, with Princess Mary, with Elizabeth. So that's really interesting. And then we've got her fall and her attempts to save herself. And, you know, then the realisation she's falling. So, I mean, totally objectively, Anne Boleyn is clearly miles away the most interesting of the four of Henry's wives I've written about. But, I mean, they are all really interesting. We've got Jane Seymour, who's a real unknown quantity, often very, very criticised for her role in Anne Boleyn's fall. I think quite unfairly in that you know, she cannot have seen the execution coming and was probably very, as shocked as anyone else that Anne was executed. But she's such an unknown quantity. She presents herself as so meek and so mild. And yet, actually, we can see Jane, from what we have of the sources, sort of calculating, she certainly really does a number on Henry. You know, she manages to persuade Henry to marry her, which was really impressive because he of course he ends his second marriage to his uh, supposed great love Anne Boleyn for Jane she then holds on to the throne and she's it's so tragic that she died in childbirth because that was the one moment where Jane was secure Henry would never put away the mother of his legitimate son she would have been perfectly safe completely safe she could have been much more political and she certainly would have been regent for Edward so she's so interesting and then Anne of Cleves I mean Anne of Cleves is just fabulous foreign princess disastrous marriage and but she really came out of it well um what i was really interested when i was researching Anne was reading the reports of carl haas who is the ambassador from cleves because it gives the the german Anne's point of view of the divorce when we normally just see the english point of view and that was really fascinating because actually it makes her a much more complex character she was very, very worried that she would be executed. She was worried that her brother would have her murdered if she was sent home to Cleves because of the shame that she'd brought on the family. And so she kind of made the best of the situation. To save herself, she agreed to the annulment. But actually, Carl Haas tells us that Anne never really agreed with the annulment and that she declared she would be Henry's true wife until the day she died. So that kind of puts an interesting slant on her. And then we've got Catherine Parr, who is the first, Protestant Queen of England because Anne of Cleves was a Catholic um, so we have Catherine Parr the first Protestant Queen of England she raises Henry's children she brings the family together but she's also such a passionate woman you know she was passionately in love with Thomas Seymour we can see it in her letters and just so complex very very religious a writer the first English woman to publish under her no own name but we've also got this passionate side to her which is very very different from the view of her as Henry's nursemaid. The other day on Twitter you had made mention of Catherine Parr and a poem from Henry VIII. Are you able to elaborate on that at all? So it's in my book on the temptation of Elizabeth Tudor. Um, it's off the top of my head, I haven't reviewed it for a while. It's in a prayer book, and it's basically sort of talking about himself, you know, how she she should submit to him, and you know, it's it's quite it's quite racy. I can go and get it in a minute if you want. Oh, I own the book, so I should have known it uh, was in there. Yeah, no, it's in there somewhere. It's in the courtship, but it's been a while since I looked at it. But it's really, I mean, it shows that he was looking for 
a sexual partner for a bedmate. You know, he's, he's not just looking for someone to bandage his leg, which is often how Catherine Parr was portrayed, because actually, um, you know, he could pay nurses. He didn't need to marry a nurse. He was looking for someone who would perhaps bear him children. But actually, Catherine Parr's a, a really bad choice at this stage if you're looking for more children. If your primary role, if your primary motive for marrying is to have more sons, then Catherine Parr is a ridiculous choice because she'd been twice widowed and has no children. As far as we know, she'd never had a child. She certainly doesn't have any surviving children by the time of her marriage to Henry. So he wasn't you know, he probably hoped that there would be children. We know he hoped there would be children, but he can't have assumed that there would be. So actually, he's attractive to Catherine. She's a she's an attractive widow, and he wants to have sex with her, basically. And, you know, we can see this in this poem, and kind of, you know, in the facts of the relationship. It must have been horrifying for her. Do we know if Henry knew about Thomas and Catherine? It's a tricky one. I mean, I, I would assume that he does to some extent because you know, the court's not that not that big you know social circles interact i would think it's quite likely he thomas is sent off on an embassy sort of in the courtship in henry's courtship so that seems quite likely that it was getting him out of the way i would think there would have been enough rumors that henry would have had an idea that he had a rival but obviously he's the king and you know he's going to prevail and I'm sure if Thomas actually had feelings for Catherine Parr, that he was probably a little relieved to not have to be at court. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I think it's pretty clear that Thomas did have feelings for Catherine. It's, it's difficult because obviously their marriage doesn't go brilliantly well after Henry's death. But for the fact that they were planning to marry in 1543, I think it clearly shows that there's feelings between the couple because Catherine was quite a wealthy widow, but nothing spectacular. Whereas Thomas Seymour was the brother-in-law of the king, the uncle of the heir to the throne, the Prince of Wales. So he, he could have made a much, much better marriage. I mean, there were rumours that the Duke of Norfolk wanted him to marry his daughter, for example. So the fact that he was planning to marry Catherine, at least what she says in her letter, but I mean, it's a letter addressed to him. So I think we can assume that she's telling the truth. Um, the fact that he was planning to marry Catherine Parr himself, I think that does show that he loved her and that there were feelings. I've always appreciated how you have done such a good job at being more fair to Thomas Seymour's story than many others have. So I thank you personally for that. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm fond of Tom. I'm fond of Thomas. Um, he made bad choices um, quite often, I'd yeah. say. Um, he's a man that isn't as clever as he thinks as he thinks he is, you know, he, I mean, he clearly thinks that he was very intelligent and very politically adept, quite Machiavellian, I think. And actually he wasn't. And I think contemporaries could see through that really. I mean, there's a sort of famous quote about him that he was somewhat empty of matter. And I think that's, there's a lot of bluster, a lot of boasting in what Thomas does and contemporaries see it. But I mean, when I was writing The Temptation of Elizabeth Tudor, and it's, it's, I mean, he is The Temptation of Elizabeth Tudor in this book, so it is largely about Thomas. And I was fond of him. I, I wrote his execution scene, and I was sad, actually, that he was beheaded. And of course, I knew it was going that way. But actually, I did feel sorry for him. And I, I do appreciate that his relationship with Elizabeth is quite unsavory. Um, it's not paedophilia, not in the way that we would understand it now. She's a teenager. She is, you know, 14 years old. But, mar you know, once you were 14, you were marriageable. So, you know, yes, it is a little unpleasant to modern eyes and certainly it was unpleasant to eyes in the 16th century to some level. But it's, you know, it, it was not unknown for a older man to, you know, want to marry a 14-year-old. It's not not as unpleasant as it looks today. Um, his conduct towards Elizabeth is pretty shocking, and it was pretty would have been pretty shocking to a contemporary. You know, he was sort of climbing into bed and um, tickling her, and you know, generally being very over familiar. Um, so that is another side of his character. So I don't think that Thomas is an entirely positive figure, but I don't think many people are. I think, you know, actually it's it's important to find the balance. And I do have a soft spot for Thomas and I am very fond of him, albeit that at times I think I think he behaved like an absolute nightmare. 
He was definitely a narcissist. He was. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the world revolved around Thomas as far as Thomas was concerned. And he just he clearly thought that he was due greater things and actually his ability and not just his ability, but also his ability to sort of network and build his career up. Actually, he wasn't he wasn't good enough, effectively. Well, and on that note, we have reached the final bit of the interview when I make you choose between two historical figures and we call it If I Made You Choose. Okay. Okay. So (laughs) what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer up two names. I want you to give me the answer, pause for a second, and then tell me why. Okay. Okay. The first one is Henry VIII or Elizabeth I? Elizabeth I. Um, it's got to be Elizabeth I. I'm quite fond of Henry. Um, I always try and stand up for him when people try and say he's one of the worst kings because he's not. He's not a bad king. Um, he's a bad person. But Elizabeth is a fabulous queen and did so much for women. I mean, unintentionally because she was she very much saw herself as an exception among women and so didn't promote women and didn't kind of, you know, push feminism, if you like. But, you know, she was such an icon of queenship. And, you know, you have later queens, you have Queen Anne, you have deliberately referencing Elizabeth I. And she was just fabulous. She really held her own as queen. And the odds were so stacked against her becoming queen and then lasting as queen. So, no, she's fabulous. And the next one is Thomas Cromwell or Thomas Wolsey. That's a tricky one. Um, I am going to go with Thomas Cromwell. Okay, so this one is really tricky. Um, They're both really fascinating. They come from very humble origins. They both reach the pinnacle of Tudor politics, so the king's chief minister, respectively. Um, I'm going with Thomas Cromwell. I think it's really interesting what he did with the Reformation um, and the dissolution of the monasteries. He's the architect of the dissolution of the monasteries. And it was very, very traumatic when you think that pretty much every community was close to or had a monastery in it of some kind. It was hugely traumatic. And the fact that the money from the church passed into secular hands, that's not really a positive, but it was very transformative. And I think... In the long run, it was probably quite good for the kingdom. You know, it brings more wealth back into the state. Um, But it's really interesting. I find him more interesting than Wolsey, I think. Whereas Wolsey is fabulous, but he's still very much within the medieval career in the church. But it's Thomas Cromwell who really changes the narrative, changes the script and goes off and does his own thing. Anne Boleyn or Jane Seymour? That's also tricky. Um... Oh, I get in trouble if I say Jane. Um, Jane Seymour. Okay, I I like them both, and I think they're both interesting. I think that um, Jane Seymour gets a really bad press um, because Anne Boleyn was executed, and I feel bad about that because I don't think that she deserves it. Um, so I'm saying her, but I do actually like them both. Um, Jane, yes, she very she very clearly. Um, pushed for marriage with Henry. He was asking her to be his mistress. She then clearly sees that Anne's lost her baby, that she um, is is starting to lose influence over Henry, and she pushed for marriage and very much, you know, kind of implied that, you know, maybe they should get married, maybe he should get rid of Anne. But it's it's Henry who does get rid of Anne, and it's Henry who decides to behead her. And I really cannot see how Jane would have seen that Anne was going to be beheaded. And certainly she would have had no say in it. I think she's really interesting because, you know, we just have hints of her character. She seems quite religiously conservative, which is quite interesting. Um, her, the fact that she kneels before Henry to basically intercede for the rebels in the Pilgrimage of Grace, that was a very, very brave thing to do. So I think... Jane is quite brave because she's seen what has happened to her predecessor and that's always hanging over her head. And she's a real what if because I'd like to have seen more of Jane. So that's why I'm saying Jane, but I do really like Anne Boleyn as well. I'm not sure I would have been friends with Anne Boleyn, but I think she's really, really fascinating. Now, this one should be interesting. Empress Matilda or Eleanor of Aquitaine? Okay, I'm going with Empress Matilda. That's 
a no brainer for me because she's actually my very, very favorite queen in the whole of like British history. I love the Empress Matilda. Um, but I do like Eleanor as well. But the reason I like the Empress Matilda so much is that it's just brilliant that we, you know, it would have been better if we'd obviously had a reigning queen, but it's great that we almost had a reigning queen in the 12th century because history is, you know, politics and history in the period is so male dominated. You get king, king, king. And the fact that Matilda stood up for her rights and, you know, said, nope, I'm, I'm going to, try and take back my crown i'm not gonna it's not gonna be my husband jeffrey he's not gonna do it obviously he does a bit in normandy but not in england it's gonna be me i'm gonna go and i'm gonna become queen and she really really fought for her rights and she wasn't doing it for her husband and she wasn't doing it for her son and she got such a bad press in the period because she was standing up for her rights and because she was being unwomanly and I think she's fabulous. And she so nearly did it. In 1141, she's declared Lady of the English. Stephen is in prison. And ultimately, she released Stephen in return for her half-brother, who had been captured by Stephen's queen. But she so nearly did it. And she certainly kept her son's claim going, at least. And even after her son becomes king and she's retired um, to Normandy, she's still a real force to be reckoned with. When Henry grants charters for the pair of them it's a, it's matilda who comes first and he's known as henry fitz empress he's not you know henry fitz jeffrey his father it's his mother she's just f fabulous and i really wish that she'd managed to become queen properly without stephen i hate stephen <laughs> And the last one, I feel like I already asked you this one, but I have asked every single guest so far this season, this one, Edward Seymour or Thomas Seymour? So it's got to be Thomas. Um, I mean, Edward Seymour, he's definitely much cleverer, much more adept politically than Thomas. But I mean, yeah, I mean, personality wise, he's a bit of a nightmare, really. Um, you know, very, very sort of pious in a, you know, sort of clearly thinks he's more intelligent and, and sort of better than the people he's around. I mean, Thomas is just so interesting. Thomas, as I said, you know, he's not as clever as he thinks he is. And he just does the craziest things. You know, um, you know, he was involved in piracy. I mean, that's fabulous. He was a pirate. Um, when he, you know, he was a naval commander. He came from Wiltshire. There are no seas anywhere near Wiltshire. It's in the middle of England. Um, but he wanted to be an admiral, a naval captain. And his first command, his first attempt to command a fleet went horribly wrong. And he ended up effectively crashing into the Isle of Wight when he was supposed to go to Boulogne. But, you know, he carried on. He carried on. Um Thomas is great. Um, he's such a complex and such an interesting character. And, and Edward is as well. But I'm, I'm definitely on Tom, Team Thomas, albeit I think Edward would have been a much better ruler of England than Thomas. And in fact, you know, Edward was for a bit. I absolutely love the way you described <laughs> Oh, he's great. I like, I like Thomas. He's great. But uh, some things he did were inherently quite funny. When you're sort of reading about them and you just say, oh, God, Thomas, don't. Oh, Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on the show today. Is there anything um, exciting that you have in the works that you can tell listeners that they should look out for? I, yeah, book-wise, I'm still kind of in between books. Um, but I've been doing some filming for things I'm not really allowed to say, but there'll be a, a couple of shows coming out with me on, one with me quite a bit on, um, probably early next year. So I will kind of know about Queens, but I will do more details probably on Twitter later. Wonderful. I'm excited to learn more about that. And, of course, all of your books are available on Amazon. Is there anywhere else you would like to send people to? Uh, no, um, Amazon's good. I um, buy my books. Um, the most recent one's Lives of Tudor Women. That's quite pleased with that one. <laughs> and they can also find you on social media. I know for sure that you are on Twitter. Can they find you anywhere else? Yeah, I'm mostly on Twitter. So look me up on Twitter. It's E Norton History. Um, Elizabeth Norton was already taken, so I'm E Norton History. But that's where I'm most active. So do come along and say hi because it's always really fun. And I know that I have quite a lot of chats with Rebecca on Twitter. It is such a good time. So thank you for that. And thank you again for being on the show today. No problem. Thank you very much for inviting me. And now, Ask the Expert. Stephanie's guest this week on Ask the Expert is author and historian Leanda Delisle. Leanda gets to answer all your questions about the Gray Sisters. I'm looking forward to hearing the questions. 
Okay, so we've actually asked a bunch of people on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram um, some questions about the Gray Sisters, and we know that you are always the expert on that. So without further ado, we're just going to get started. Um, our friend Neam on Twitter wanted to know, Jane Grey reported being abused, or at the very least mistreated by her parents, while neither of her sisters seem to have reported the same treatment. Why do you think this is? I think this is because it was made up. I think it's a part of the sort of myths that surrounds uh, Jane's life. Uh, Jane is said to have complained that she was ill-treated by her parents, but if you look um, at where that information comes from, it comes from a man called Roger Asham, who t said that Jane had complained to him about her parents years after Jane had uh, died. At the time um, when he saw her, um, she um, appears to have said no such thing, and he wrote her a letter, in fact, saying how proud her parents were of her. Um, and I think one has to bear in mind that you know, he had, he had reasons for saying uh, what he did. So when, at the time that he claimed that uh, Jane was saying that uh, her parents were uh, bullying her, uh, as I said, Jane was long dead by then, and her sister, Catherine, was heir to Elizabeth's throne. And Elizabeth was feeling extremely threatened uh, by Catherine. And so one reason, one way of, I suppose, of encouraging Elizabeth to believe that Catherine didn't pose a terrible threat was to play down the threat that Jane had uh, originally posed to both Elizabeth and Mary Tudor. Um, and he did this, and one of the ways he did this was by claiming that uh, Jane had been terribly bullied by her parents and that both her parents had been involved in this bullying. Uh, it's also interesting that immediately after Jane's death, there was talk about um, her father uh, pushing her to do things she didn't want to do, um, but not her mother. And um, when Roger Ashton was saying, which I think was 1564-ish, that um, uh, Francis Brandon, uh, Jane's mother, was also involved, Francis was, al was also dead. So, you know, the dead weren't able to defend themselves. Of course. Um, so we have a similar question then from Keldon Flop. I'm sorry if I said that wrong, on Instagram. Were they close with each other, um, not just with the parents? I know you've answered the, the parents' part of the question, but as a trio of sisters, did you find them to be close? That's, a, that's, an, interesting, that's an interesting question. Um, well, they were, the thing is, Jane essentially left home when she was very young, 11, I think, from memory. Uh, but... She, there was certainly a relationship. And so when she was in the tower uh, and again to be executed, she did write one of the, her last letters was to her sister, Catherine, who she very much saw as her heir, as her sort of spiritual heir. Um, so there was that connection. How, how personal the connection was, we really, we really don't know. Um, you don't hear... You don't hear much of the kind of personal side of things. I, I would think that Catherine and Mary Gray, the two younger sisters, were close because they, simply because they spent more time together when they were growing up. And then how close were the Gray sisters to Elizabeth and Mary Tudor? Did they know each other well? That's from Janae on Facebook. Yes, they did, because um, their mother uh, was... Um, was first cousin was, was was the first cousin of Elizabeth and uh, and and Mary Tudor. So you know they were very much part of the same family, and um, they used to go as children. The the three little girls used to go and stay with certainly with Mary Tudor before she became queen, and after she became queen. Well, of course, you know there was the the tragedy of of, of Jane, you know, being in the tower and then being executed by Mary. Um, so not very friendly, you might say, um, but a little less than friendly, <laughs> a little less than friendly to chop off the head of this. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but um, uh, but uh, but she had felt very threatened by 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 Jane at this point. Um, and um, so it was interesting how quick she was to bring M Catherine and Mary Gray back into the fold, back at court and and indeed gave Catherine a place 
in her bedchamber, which is a very sort of honoured place, very sort of in her private rooms. Uh, so Catherine had a very, was given a very honoured place at court, much more honoured than the, than the position Elizabeth gave her. And indeed, in fact, when Elizabeth became queen, almost the first thing she did was, was to demote Catherine out of the privy chamber um, into, into more public rooms um, because you know, she, she felt personally threatened uh, by, 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 by Catherine being her, being her heir in law. We actually had a question from Ellie that kind of builds on what you just said, Ellie on Instagram, that was wondering what the sisters did once Jane was executed. Did Elizabeth ever bestow favors on her sister? Did she, on her sisters? Did she have them at court? And you kind of answered that a little bit, but um, if you wanted well, to talk about maybe yeah, Mary I too. Mean, it- it is interesting because, you know, Elizabeth is the sort of great goddess of English Protestant nationalism, and yet she destroyed her English Protestant heirs, um, you know, who were, as I said, her heirs in law in English statute were Catherine and Mary Gray, who were also English and Protestant. And uh, Elizabeth set out uh, to destroy them and indeed did destroy them. The first thing she did was to, was to demote Catherine Gray um, at court. Uh, she didn't want Catherine to get married under any circumstances at all. And uh, when Catherine did get married, she put her in the tower and uh, imprisoned her in and out of the tower for the rest of her life uh, until she died. Um, and, um, and with Mary Tudor as well, Mary, not Mary Tudor, I'm sorry, Mary Gray, little Mary Gray, was at court and, until, again, until she married, uh, after which she um, ended up uh, imprisoned. She because because Mary didn't marry anybody as 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 didn't married a commoner, so somebody who didn't uh, threaten Elizabeth's position in the way that uh, Catherine's husband did, because he was a great nobleman with uh, with royal blood. Um, Mary was better treated, and when her husband died, after her husband died, she was eventually released and allowed to come back to court. Um, but she was hardly a favourite. I just want to go back to how you said you called her Little Mary Gray. <laughs> that's yeah. that's actually one of the questions Jody from Facebook wanted to know: Was Mary Gray really a little person? Yes, she was. Um, I think she suffered from scoliosis, which ran in the family. Now, we all know now about Richard the uh, Third. How you know when when they dug up his body under that car park in Leicester, they found that he had a scoli- scoliosis. Which is, uh, which is a condition which is often inherited. And, um, of course, uh, the Greys uh, were royal. Uh, they were part Plantagenet uh, through Henry VII's um, wife, uh, you know, Elizabeth, of, Elizabeth of York. And interestingly, Edward VI, their cousin Edward VI, also had scoliosis, although not to the same degree that Mary seemed to have had it, maybe because he died younger, I don't know, maybe she didn't have it so severely. But I think that Mary um, was described rather cruelly by one foreign ambassador as uh, crook-backed and very ugly. But uh, she clearly wasn't ugly to everybody because the man who fell in love with her was the biggest man at court. Uh, and, um, you know, he risked his, 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 his life for her. I have heard that, too, that she was kind of one of the smallest people around who married the biggest guy around. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, William, William Sissel actually commented on it, described it as sort of monstrous that the smallest person at court had married the biggest. And his job, Thomas Keyes, her husband, his job was, to, was it, well, he was a guy in charge of palace security. And imagine this was a time when everyone, everyone was armed armed to the teeth, and, um, and they were frequently not very well, and no antibiotics, no painkillers, they drank like fishes. Um, so, um, you, know, they, you know, they were quite a lot of quite dangerous people around. So if you were going to be in charge of Paris, palace security, you know, you needed to be a tough guy. And, um, you know, sure. and, and he was, he was, you know, obviously a very big man. Right, like the, like the palace bouncer. <laughs> he was, exactly. He was like the palace bouncer, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so moving on to Kate from Instagram. How close were Jane and Catherine Parr, since we know that she lived in her home for some time? Furthermore, were there any rumors of anything between Thomas Seymour and Jane at the time? We all know the rumors about Elizabeth. Thank goodness um, 
Rebecca is not <laughs> on this part, but um, while Jane was living with Catherine and Thomas, what was the relationship like with both of them? Well, I think that I think that Catherine was um, someone who was very good with uh, children uh, and with young women. She was, I think, Elizabeth was very fond of her, uh, and uh, Jane too. She was uh, Catherine was, inside, ta- was a highly sort of intelligent. A woman, uh, except when it came to love. Uh, unfortunately, she fell in love with the wrong man in the case of Thomas Seema. Um, we don't know of any kind of sexual shenanigans between, I mean, J- Jane was that much younger than Elizabeth. She wasn't adolescent. Uh, but uh, Thomas was an extremely ambitious man and was very pleased to have, uh, you know, and was the, was the one who you know, had, had convinced um, Jane's parents that he should be you know, that she should become his ward. Um, and um, the reason he did this was that, uh, you know, he, she, he hoped it would put him in a more powerful position. The, you know, the more heirs to the throne he had essentially in his control, Elizabeth and Jane, uh, the better for him, the more leverage it gave, gave him at court. And he said that he intended to marry, he told uh, Jane's uh, father that he intended to marry, marry her off to um, the king to Edward VI. Why do you think that the king actually skipped over relatives with a stronger claim then um, in favor of the Grey Sisters? Specifically, he skipped over their mother, right? Because she would have been... Yes, absolutely. Um, Well, um, yes, this is interesting. So the real real reason begins... (laughs) Um, with the fact that um, uh, Edward VI was being raised. He was the first Protestant monarch, and um, he was a passionate uh, Protestant, and he did not want his religious reforms reversed on his death uh, by his Catholic sister, Mary. Um, but he had, you know, he, it was, it was, you know, how could he exclude her from the throne? This was the problem. Uh, and so he did so on the grounds that she was illegitimate in law, that Henry VIII had had her declared illegitimate. Uh, the problem was that Elizabeth had also been declared illegitimate. So that meant that he had to strike out both Mary and Elizabeth Tudor, both his sisters, both his half-sisters. Then, um, again, he looked really at his father's will. Um, and his father had named Francis's children as the long stop heirs. Now, I think Henry VIII had done this because he was he was anxious to keep Edward's heirs weak. He wanted weak people, um, people weak claimants as Edward's heirs. Now, why was this? You have to remember that Henry VIII was you know, looked, was looking back to see what examples of things that had happened in the past, and he remembered um, the fate of his, his uncles, his, his mother's brothers, the princes in the tower. Um, little Edward uh, V um, had inherited the throne and probably been put in the tower with his younger brother at the hands of their uncle Richard III and then had disappeared. And he didn't want the same thing happening to Edward VI. So he wanted to make sure there were no Richard III figures around his son. So he, he demoted the Stuart line um, anyone basically who was any kind of adult male in the who was remote, any royal connection was cut off. So the Stuart right. line, um, because you know he couldn't control who who Mary Queen of Scots was likely to marry because she was a foreign queen. Francis uh, was was married, of course, to an adult um, uh, adult man, and so he he ignored her claim as well. And the long stop as were then were were Francis's children, these three little girls who had a very distant claim under common law. So Edward, was, again, was looking back at, at, at Henry VIII's will. Um, and the other thing is that Francis's husband, Harry Gray, Marcus of Dorset, wasn't a greatly respected figure. Um, and, you know, they needed, the, the, the sort of Protestant elite needed to have figures they could sort of trust to unite behind if, if, if this was going to go ahead, um, excluding these two, the two Tudor sisters. Uh, and so anyway, so he chose Jane. And I think there was a further reason as well, is that Frances was a woman in her 30s. She hadn't had a child for some time. It was very unlikely she was going to produce a, a male heir at this stage. If she did, then at, 
Edward was, was happy to leave the throne to this boy. Uh, Jane, Jane and the others, you know, were more likely to be able to have children in the future and have male heirs. And speaking of Jane, did, did Jane actually even want the throne? Did she know that this was coming? Um, was she aware of the situation or was this just total manipulation on the part of the Dudleys and her family? And Well, uh, she was only 16. She didn't have a great deal of say in, in what was happening. Um, but and I think I think you know events unfolded very quickly. Nobody expected things to unfold quite as quickly as they did, or in the way they did. Um, but I would think that you know she she was she was a like Edward, like her cousin. She was a passionate Protestant. She would not have wanted um, whatever sort of various. Uh, uh, Outsiders later claimed um, she would she would not have wanted um, Mary Tudor to, uh, as, as as queen. She would have believed um, that God was unlikely to want to have someone who she believed. I mean, she described Catholics as one point as having uh, their, their, their souls being the the stinking kennels of Satan. So, if you think, oh my. <laughs> Mary Tudor's soul is a is a is a stinking kennel of Satan, and so it would have seemed unlikely to her that God would have wanted um, someone like Mary Tudor to become queen, and so it would have made sense to her that it was God's providence, divine will, that she should become queen, whether she wanted it or not, and she would have accepted it as such. That's really interesting because I think that the general kind of view of her is that she was just this pawn that didn't want any part of it and everybody was, you know, taking advantage of her. But no, to put it that way, it definitely doesn't sound that way. No, no, Jane was, she was a young girl, um, but she was um, highly intelligent, highly educated and far more than a pawn. Um, you know, people don't des- didn't describe Edward the Sixth always as being a, a sort of pawn, and it is interesting that they they do so for Jane. And, and there were reasons for that after her fall. And there were reasons for her being described as this sort of pathetic, weak little thing. And what what is interesting about it is that both sides, both her, both those who supported her her rule and those who opposed it. The one thing that united them is they both had very good reasons for pretending that she was just this little pawn of the Dudleys after she fell. I think we have to remember that even though she was very young, she was already, um, you know, becoming a, a sort of a, a, a leader, really, um, a religious leader. People were dedicating uh, books to her. Great ladies at court were writing, you know, admiring letters to her. Um, you know, that her father believed, and possibly her tutors hoped that she could one day be Queen of England and be married to Edward VI. You know, this, this, this is this is not just sort of some little girl sort of skipping around in the country with nothing in her head but butterflies. Yeah, thank you, and thank you to the history gal for that question on Instagram. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention you before. Um, we heard that Mary didn't actually want to execute Lady Jane once she was on the throne. Um, Teresa G. from Twitter wanted to know what were the circumstances around that that forced her to do so, or did she actually really want to do it the whole time? She didn't want to do it the whole time. Definitely not. Uh, when uh, she became uh, queen in um, 1553, she wanted uh, what she wanted was... Jane was going to be tried uh, for treason. Inevitably, she would be found guilty. Uh, But then uh, Mary intended to pardon her. Mary wanted to heap all the possible blame onto uh, the Dudleys, uh, particularly the Duke of Northumberland. She needed to unite the elite behind her, and she'd been signalling before Jane fell that this was what she was going to do, that everything was going to be blamed on the Dudleys, and um, that, um, you know, that she was going to keep the number of executions to an absolute minimum. And she wanted people to believe that Edward, her brother, had been manipulated by the Duke of Northumberland. Um, having Jane manipulated as well, you know, played into that story. Um, but the real jane rather than the sort of pretend jane who was who was just a little pawn um made her 
feelings extremely evident in December. Jane was a very passionate Protestant, as I've mentioned. And when uh, she heard that Mary was going to introduce the Catholic uh, mass to England, she wrote an open letter to a former tutor who was a, become a Catholic convert, uh, condemning his actions and saying people must oppose the introduction of the mass and rise, rise again in Christ's war. Now, whether she meant that literally or figuratively, at the very same time, her father was you know, being involved in raising a rebellion against uh, Mary. And when that rebellion was crushed, uh, Mary had a decision to make. And she decided that um, Jane had proved too much of a threat, that Jane was going to remain, uh, was obviously determined to remain a the, the Protestant religious leader she had always been, um, and therefore she needed to have her head cut off. And I don't think Jane, uh, so, you know, it was put out there, Mary wanted to be merciful and so forth, because queens were expected to be merciful. But I think you know, Mary had decided head need to come, needed to come off at that stage. Head needs to come off. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I feel like we could talk about Jane pretty much all day. Um, a lot of our questions from our followers came for, came um, about Jane, but I think we can switch gears a little bit to give you a little refresher. How did Catherine feel about her first husband? This is from Zesty Celery on Instagram. Oh, her first husband. Well, of course, you know, she was very, you know, she was very young um as was as was this boy Herbert, who was was, was take was came to the altar ill i mean he was sort of green um and um so um that must have been all rather all rather disturbing um and then you know they were then sort of separate as soon as as soon as um jane fell they were then they were then separated um i think you know they were two sort of teenagers together in a very uh, difficult uh, situation. Um, I, I doubt they were ever really much more than friends. The marriage wasn't um, wasn't uh, consummated. Uh, but you know, I think he obviously was fond of Catherine, uh, and she later fell in love with you know this uh, other other person, um, the Earl of Hertford, um, Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford, and. Um, she became pregnant by him um, after a secret marriage, but then he was in France, and uh, and she was thinking, well, what on earth am I going to do about this? And then so she sort of went running back to husband number one, and essentially tried to sort of seduce him and convince him that you know he they can get married again, uh, and he sort of discovered that she was pregnant and was understandably extremely angry about about all this. So I how did he discover that? That's crazy. I know, I know. Um, well, I mean, she was happy. She was became more and more pregnant. It became very, you know, everyone started noticing. Um, and um, uh, yes, I mean, so uh, I think you know he was obviously attracted to her, um, and but I think she she just you know used him really. Sure. So she was noticeably pregnant. So that far along. Now, absolutely, this is the problem. She was becoming more and more pregnant, and she couldn't hide it any longer. And she was at court, and eventually, she had to go and see uh, Robert Dudley and say to him, who was, of course, you know, her, you know, sort of was related, was, was was sort of related because Guilford Dudley, his brother, had been married to Jane, right? And he was, you know, now in love with Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was in love with him. And and she said to him, you know, you know, I'm pregnant. Help, help! You know, please, can you sort of talk to the Queen so she's not too angry about it? And he did get, indeed go and talk to the Queen, um, but Elizabeth was extremely angry and promptly threw her in the tower. Catherine couldn't get a break from, from Elizabeth at all. Um, no. But that said, so Lisa from Twitter said Mary watched her sister Catherine incur Elizabeth's wrath for marrying without permission. Uh, and then she went and did it herself, too. So did she expect a different outcome or did she think that she could hide it or... You know, what, what What were your thoughts on why Mary would do the exact same thing? I know. I, know. I, I think she expected, I think she hoped for a different outcome. I think she hoped she could keep it quiet, you know, because she did do it secretly, at least for a while. She hoped she could keep it quiet. Um, 
But I think she also hoped for a different outcome because, you know, the person she was marrying a very different person in Thomas Keyes, you know, this, this, this body, this, this bouncer. Um, by marrying this man, she had effectively ruined her chances of ever becoming Queen of England because, you know, the, 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 she would, Thomas Keyes would never have been accepted as a king consort. And indeed, their mother, Frances, had married um, a, a servant, um, a, a gentleman servant, but not a nobleman, after the death of their father, um, to show to Mary Tudor that she too no longer posed a threat, and that had been very successful. And you know, after Frances' remarriage, they'd been accepted back at court. And so I think that Mary Grey hoped she was you know, following in her mother's footsteps, marrying somebody socially beneath her, um, and so ruling herself out from you know the throne, so that she would you know no longer pose any threat to Elizabeth, and so she hoped, I'm sure, that Elizabeth might be a little bit annoyed, but would you know get over it and and forgive her very quickly. And Elizabeth didn't. Elizabeth was very very angry. Our last question is from Douglas from Instagram, and he wants to know which of the sister stories do you find the most tragic and why. That's an interesting one, Douglas. Oh, gosh. Um, I like the story of Mary Gray because she does, she finds freedom in the end and she has her own life. Um, and although it's very sad that, you know, she, when she's released from prison, her husband is dead, she's able to bring up her stepchildren, go back to court. Um, she has, she has, you know, she has a good life. Catherine, God, well, Catherine's life is, is, a, is a romance, really. It's a it's a sort of it's a tragic romance. Um, Jane, but she knew happiness though. You know, she did. She loved her husband. She, there's wonderful descriptions of her making love to him in the tower and elsewhere. They, it was a sort of passionate love affair. Did Jane ever have that? I don't know. There is something terribly. I think Jane's maybe is the most tragic because she was so so very young at only sixteen, and you have this girl like so many so many obviously. Lots of adults are very passionate about what they believe, but teenagers particularly can be so sort of pure, purest in what they what they think. And and you had this sort of typical teenager in a way, so sort of fierce and passionate, and a, such an intelligent girl, and um, to die so 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 young and is 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 tragic. Well, thank you so much for all your answers, Leanda, and thank you to all of our followers for asking all the questions. Uh, we'll let you know what our next topic is during the week. But thank you again, Leanda. Is there anything else that you wanted to tell everybody? Do you want to uh, give a shout out to your Twitter handle or your Instagram so that people can follow you and see what you're up to? Um, yeah, sure. I think I'm just at Leanda Delisle on Twitter. Um, I don't really do Instagram. I do have I do have Facebook, and I think I'm the same. Um, just Leander Delisle. Uh, and I would like to thank everyone for their questions because I, I I thought it was such an interesting interesting array of questions. Um, I hope I remembered everything correctly in my answers, and um, and I hope that uh, some of them might enjoy uh, my book, The Sisters That Would Be Queen. Where can we find that book? Well, I hope you can find it in bookshops or you can certainly find it on Amazon um, and other other websites. Oh, there's also, of course, I have my own website, at Le which is leanderdelisle.com. You can read all about it there. <laughs> Thank you, Leander. And now, a brief history. Some of the most often overlooked women in history are those who found themselves with the sister who became queen consort. Even though these women were close to power, they infrequently left a mark on history. Because of their newfound position, these women likely lived more adventurous lives than their sisters, who were strapped to the throne of England. I am of course referring to the six wives of Henry VIII. Of the six wives, only two of them were foreign brides, leaving four with family in the country. The first royal couple that comes to mind when I think about a king choosing an English bride and how that affected her entire family and the country, I think of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville. Those who were opposed to the union were even more upset that the Woodville family gained land and power so quickly. Elizabeth's sisters were married into the peerage, replacing the daughters of noblemen. 
One of the things that the first three wives of Henry VIII had in common was that they all had at least one sister. Catherine of Aragon had a few sisters, but the one we tend to hear about most is her sister, Juana. The sister that they say went mad, but likely didn't and was just a woman being pushed out in a man's world. Anne Boleyn's sister, Mary, was mistress to two monarchs, Henry VIII and Francis I. And then we come to Jane Seymour. Jane had two living sisters, Elizabeth and Dorothy. Neither caused any scandal and have easily been overshadowed by their sister, the Queen, and their brothers, Edward and Thomas. So today I want to talk to you about Elizabeth Seymour. Born about 1518, Elizabeth Seymour was the daughter of Sir John Seymour and Marjorie Wentworth of Wolf Hall in Wiltshire. In order of the surviving Seymour children, Elizabeth fell in after Edward, Henry, Thomas, and Jane, but before Dorothy. Even though Elizabeth was nearly a decade younger than her sister Jane, she was the first of the Seymour daughters to marry. At some point prior to January 1531, Sir Anthony Uhtred and Elizabeth Seymour were married. Elizabeth was quite young at the time, like 12 or 13, but was of legal age to marry her much older husband, who was in his early 50s. While Elizabeth would have been old enough to wed, she was not old enough to consummate the marriage. That would have to wait until she was 14 years old. While Elizabeth married young, it was also extremely rare that she married before her older sister Jane, who would have been in her early 20s at the time. In 1531, it is possible that Jane was already at court in the household of the Queen, Queen Catherine, and had yet to catch the King's eye. We can easily find Elizabeth at court for the new year of 1532 as she was listed as a lady in the household of Anne Boleyn. Elizabeth Uhtred was noticed as having given the king a fine shirt with a high collar. Elizabeth and Sir Anthony had two children, both born on the island of Jersey. A son, Henry, born in 1533 or 4, and a daughter, Marjorie, who was born after the death of her father in 1535. As governor of Jersey, the couple spent most of their time on the island. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with the location of Jersey, it's located in the English Channel, nearer to France than England. It's also located roughly 15 miles from the beaches of Normandy. The views Elizabeth must have experienced from that castle would have easily overshadowed Savernac Forest in Wiltshire. As governor of Jersey, Sir Anthony Uhtred worked closely with Thomas Cromwell, who by that time was the new Woolsey. The men must have had a good enough relationship as Cromwell was able to arrange the funds for repairs to the castle in which they resided. In return, Sir Anthony promised Cromwell a fine consignment of French wine. In autumn 1534, Sir Anthony Uhtred died leaving Elizabeth a very young widow with a small child and another on the way, living far away from everything that was comfortable to her. She eventually moved back to the mainland and settled in her former Uhtred residence in the north. Her time as widow must have been difficult, since we have evidence of a letter by Elizabeth to Cromwell in March of 1537, after his sister had already become queen. Now, it's been suggested that as Queen Jane received fewer requests from subjects than her two predecessors. Now, did Elizabeth recognize that her sister wielded little power? Is that why she approached Cromwell instead of her sister in March 1537? In the letter, she asked Cromwell for some abbey lands to farm. She needs money. She mentions in the letter that she would only write to Cromwell to ask for help, which she seems anxious to have. And she is looking for a new husband. Who better to help her than Cromwell? And as we know, he made the perfect play to advance his own family while helping the sister of the queen. And it wasn't like there wasn't any interest in Elizabeth. Sir Arthur Darcy was interested in keeping Elizabeth in the north, but it appears she had other plans. An interesting note, Darcy was appointed governor of Jersey after the death of Sir Anthony. But he soon sold his post to someone else, eventually falling into the hands of Elizabeth's brother, Edward Seymour, then Viscount Beecham. 
Only a few months after her letter to Cromwell, Elizabeth is mentioned in Lyle letters when John Hussey wrote, quote, The saying that my Lord Privy Seal's son and heir shall shortly marry my Lady Uhtred, my Lord Beecham's sister. I find it interesting that at the time he didn't say the Queen's sister. And it wasn't until Elizabeth, Lady Uhtred, married Gregory Cromwell in August 1537 that Hussey made mention that she was the Queen's sister. And the couple married at Cromwell's country home at Mort Lake. The plague was raging in London at the time, so a wedding in the country was the best plan, something we can all relate to in 2020. Little fuss or attention was made to the union, and that may be because of the plague. Otherwise, there was likely to have been some displeasure with the Queen's sister wedding Cromwell's son. Just over two months later, Queen Jane was dead after giving the king his longed-for prince. Elizabeth was among the principal mourners at her sister's funeral. The loss of her sister must have hurt, but it appears that all the Seymour siblings were able to survive on the life of their nephew, the future King of England. Elizabeth and Gregory Cromwell appear to have had a good relationship. Their first son together, also named Henry, was born seven months after their union. Hmm, this reminds me of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. In January 1539, after Thomas Cromwell was named Constable of Leeds Castle, Gregory and Elizabeth, and as far as I know, their children, moved into the castle. While Gregory was absent in Calais awaiting the arrival of Anne of Cleves, he wrote to Elizabeth. And in the letter, he mentions that he is well and hopes to hear the same from her. He also mentions that he is thinking about their sons. Not long after Anne of Cleves' arrival in England, Elizabeth was appointed to her household, and in April 1540, Gregory obtained his father's title, Lord Cromwell, when his father was raised to Earl of Essex. Up until this point, Elizabeth had referred to herself as Lady Uhtred because she had outranked her husband. Now she could be Lady Cromwell. Sometime after the arrest of Thomas Cromwell in June 1540, Elizabeth worried that her father-in-law's downfall would affect her family. She wrote to the king for help. He was, after all, still family. In it, she craves the king's favor and assistance despite Cromwell's, quote, most detestable offense. Thomas Cromwell himself attempted to ease the burden on his children by also writing to the king, begging him that he had hoped that he would be Quote, a good and gracious Lord to my poor son, the good and virtuous lady, his wife, and their poor children. In February 1549, Elizabeth's brother Thomas Seymour found himself in a heap of trouble when the council officially accused him of 33 charges of treason. He was convicted of treason and executed on the 20th of March. In July 1551, Gregory Cromwell died suddenly of the sweating sickness at his home in Lond Abbey. It is also noted that Elizabeth fell ill at the same time but survived her illness. In addition, that year also marked the arrest and execution of her other brother, Edward Seymour. Elizabeth was given charge of his daughters. In the spring of 1554, Elizabeth married for the third time to John Paulette, Baron St. John. They had no children. Elizabeth Seymour Uhtred Cromwell Paulette died on the 19th of March, 1568. She was buried in St. Mary's Church in Hampshire. And that concludes this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. You can find my show notes from this episode and how to become a patron at TutorsDynastyPodcast.com. Don't want to miss an episode? Be sure to subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Patreon, Podbean, or anywhere you can find podcasts. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TutorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.